Hello, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy. My name is Eli Griffin. I'm the Trail Development Coordinator here at RTC, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I'd like everyone to confirm that they can hear me and see the beginning slide containing the title of today's presentation by clicking the Raise Hand button along the right-hand side of the screen. Great. Thank you so much. If you click that button, you can uh, press it again to lower your hand. Today's topic is Rails with Trails, Safe, Common, and Growing. We have a great panel of presenters for you who will be covering a wide range of Rails with Trail topics. <clears throat> Kelly Pack, who is here with me in Washington, D.C., is Rails to Trails Conservancy's Director of Trail Development and the lead author of RTC's 2013 report, America's Rails with Trails. We'll be briefly discussing the report as well as the current state of rail with trail in the U.S. before we get into our featured presentation. Next is Jerry Walls calling in from Pennsylvania. Jerry is the former executive director and CEO of the Lycoming County Planning Commission, the current chair of the Susquehanna Greenway Partnership, and the current chairman of the Susquehanna Economic Development Association Council of Governments Joint Rail Authority Board. Mark Pearsall, calling from Arizona, is a rail transit planner from Maricopa Association of Governments, where he works on a variety of rail and transit projects. Eric Iverson, who will be co-presenting with Mark and is also calling in from Arizona, is a principal planner with the city of Tempe. And Matt Mihalovich, calling in from Arkansas, is the trails coordinator for the city of Fayetteville, where he was involved in the development of the recently completed Razorback Regional Greenway. You'll be able to review these full bios in the recorded version of the webinar that will be distributed after today's live presentation. Before our panelists begin, I'd like to get a sense of how many of our attendees are actively working on Rail with Trail projects. You'll see the simple yes-no poll on your screen in one second. I'll give you about 30 seconds to make sure we record as many responses as possible. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Now I'd like to quickly cover some housekeeping. As you may have noticed, attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar. All attendees are automatically muted as they join to keep down on possible background noise. If you have questions for our panelists, and we do encourage you to come up with some good ones, please type them in the question box, which can be expanded on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions at any time. We have built in some time today to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you can enter your issue in the question box as well. I'll respond if I'm able, but your best course of action is to contact GoToWebinar's free customer support directly or view a selection of help topics at the two links shown on the screen. If for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link. You will be able to rejoin the ongoing session at any time. And finally, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email containing a survey asking you to rank our performance on today's webinar. More information about RTC's Trail Expert Network with a link to sign up for occasional email notices from us, contact information for our presenters, and most importantly, a recorded version of today's webinar. With that, let's get started. I'm going to hand it off to Kelly Pack, RTC's Director of Trail Development. Kelly? Hi. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We have a large group, as you can see, and it was exciting to watch the poll numbers come in. More than half of you are actively involved in projects. Um, so that means that we've got about 150 projects out there that we'll be excited to learn about. Um, <clears throat> I'm really, as you saw by my profile picture, I'm somebody who loves trails and trains, so Rails with Trails are a natural fit. They're just such a great way to experience our industrial and transportation past, present, and future. Um, today, I'd just like to um, briefly kick off our webinar um, by sharing with you a, a brief background and history of Rail with Trail, um, describe a little bit about RTC's past research efforts, and then set the stage for our panelists whose projects really illustrate the range of issues that are specific to Rail with Trail and to, to trail development in general sometimes. 
So we're going to begin by setting your expectations a little bit. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to find this book at your local bookstore. Um, as many of you who are involved in these types of projects um, or have, have worked, in them, worked on them in the past, you know that um, there are guidelines and resources and examples that might help you along, but each project comes with its unique challenges and maybe some opportunities that make it possible, um, that make it really impossible to create a replicable roadmap for easy solutions. Um, but with that disclaimer, um, we're, we're going to just go ahead and jump in um, by, by taking a look back. Let's go back 100 years to the height of the railroad industry in the U.S. when there were 275,000 miles of active railway that crisscrossed our nation. And this um, network was six times larger than the interstate uh, system is today. Fast forward. Um, to present day, and only about half of that system is still operational. But from that loss, we gained an incredible network of rail trails, many of which have acted as spines or have sparked much larger interconnected trail networks in communities, large and small. So what you're seeing right now is a screenshot of RTC's Trail Finder website, traillink.com. Um, where we collect and map information from not only rail trails, but other multi-use trails, and that number continues to grow. So as the trails movement has blossomed um, across the U.S., communities have naturally forced an evolution in trail planning as local jurisdictions, states, and trail advocates look for ways to grow and connect their trail and active transportation systems. So often, these existing rights of ways um, present a much needed opportunity to co-use um, established linear infrastructure. Um, it's often challenging to find that, that type of corridor when access to open space and right of ways is limited. And for our purposes, we define rail with trail as shared use paths that are on or directly <coughs> adjacent to active railroad corridors. <coughs> Just as the rail trail movement began in the 1960s and 70s, we're seeing more and more successful and popular Rails with Trails projects from our urban core and from coast to coast. They exist along freight lines, and we're seeing more um, that are having partnerships with excursion rail, so offering really unique opportunities for people to experience the rail and the trail at the same time. And then a growing number of trails uh, along light rail and transit corridors. We started tracking, tracking open and project rails with trails in the mid-90s and first produced a report in 2000 that just kind of chronicled um, these open projects and talked about the trends that we were seeing at the time. Then two years later, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a report which still remains the most comprehensive review of design practices and rail with trail development process. Flash forward, you know, more than a decade, and we were looking to see um, how those trends have changed and evolved. We were, um, we received uh, support and funding from the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to take a, a national look at Rails with Trails, um, where we interviewed 88 trail managers from 33 states uh, to create this report and provide more tools for trail managers and advocates as they work on these projects. We found uh, from that report through kind of an inventory that extended beyond our interviews that there were about 161 known Rails with Trails. That's about 10% of all the rail trails. And of those uh, trails, about 540 miles that were actually alongside active right-of-way in 41 states. So what does the report cover? Uh, it really looks at the nature of these projects, from how they are uh, acquired to the ownership rights, what the nature of the railroad operations, trail designs, uh, and then we address liability and insurance. And of course, Safety is always the number one issue and concern 
um, and understandably. We, through, through our research, we did identify two known, um, at the time it was one known fatality, and then post the release of our report, another fatality in, um, on the Santa Fe Rail Trail. Um, this, even though we do have these two examples, we still think that this suggests providing a well-designed pathway provides a safe travel alternative and might reduce incentives to trespass or use tracks with shortcuts. So in other words, rails as trails might actually help railroads reduce trespassing, which is really one of their most vexing safety problems. Some other things included in the report are examples of recreational use statutes that have been strengthened by states like Virginia and Maine to explicitly include railroads within the language. Um, also, state policies like New Jersey DOT's adopted short-term action plan that addresses safety along railroad corridors. And then Jerry's going to talk to you a little bit more about the design standards that CETACOG produced. Over the past three years since the report was produced, we've uncovered more rails with trails. Uh, now we know of 270 of them and nearly 800 miles along active rights of way in 42 states. We have a lot of resources on our website. We'd like for you to take a look at the report if you haven't already. Um, <clears throat> we also have a summary in our trail building toolbox. We do a lot with our communications teams to highlight successful examples of Rails with Trails, including in our magazine, um, through social media. And we also provide in our resources a Flickr page with a growing number of good images um, that illustrate uh, successful Rails with Trails. These, all of these resources are available at railswithtrails.org backslash rail with trail. Uh, as part of this webinar series, we're really aiming to build on our existing resources and, and to take you to the next level, or maybe just inspire a view from a different angle. Um, so we encourage you to, to go to, those, to, to our website Take a look at the report. If you're unfamiliar with Rails with Trails, that will give you a good primer. But we're going to jump in today, um, roll our sleeves up, and dive a little bit deeper. You're going to hear from the experience of a railroader and a trail advocate who has a deep understanding of how to navigate railroads in their culture and also you know, came up with new design guidelines within their jurisdiction. You're going to get a really great overview of how one community is dealing with uh, improving at-grade crossings, and then a profile of a successful rail trail that's now incorporated excursion rail and bike service. My contact information is available here. Um, again, we're just so happy to have all of you join us here today. We look forward to seeing your questions at the end, so feel free to be typing those in as we go along. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jerry Walsh. Good afternoon. Uh, as you can see uh, from the map of our rail authorities territory, uh, we are railroads, uh, five different freight railroads are in central and north central Pennsylvania, and they are not connected. The way that we do get rail connections is through the class one carrier, principally Norfolk Southern. Our rail authority was formed as an eight-county authority under the Pennsylvania Municipality Authorities Act. And our joint rail authority owns five freight railroads um, in Pennsylvania. We carry between 18,000 and 32,000 carloads of freight a year. Each of those member county boards of commissioners appoints two voting members to the joint rail authority board of directors. And those are just citizen service, non-paid uh, types of board member positions. The rail authority is somewhat unique in that its structure is a public-private partnership. Uh, the rail authority owns all the land and infrastructure, including tracks, bridges, rail yards, engine houses, and miscellaneous buildings. So that means that that's a very different decision-making structure than what you have with the Class 1 large railroads. 
the Joint Rail Authority contracts with a private railroad operating company to supply crew and locomotives, specialty rail cars, and the crew to do the maintenance along with their maintenance equipment and to conduct train operations. The Rail Authority also contracts with this private railroad operating company to provide customer service, marketing, and routine annual maintenance according to our Rail Authority standards, which are higher than the Federal Railroad Administration standards. Next. Um, our Rails with Trails policy uh, was arrived at with a great deal of anguish and, and discussion. And our standard is that we, our normal right-of-way uh, extends to the width of 30 to 33 feet from the track center line. Now that varies a great deal from place to place. Some of it's narrower and some is, is uh, wider. Uh, where the rail authority extends beyond that 30 to 33 feet and there is no other parallel track, a trail may certainly be considered. And if accepted by the authority, separation by a chain link fence at a minimum of 60 inches high needs to be installed no less than 25 feet from the track center line. And, and that would be arrived at through a review of the detailed plan. Uh, next, you can see an illustration of what this means in terms of a cross-section of the distance between the track center line and the trail. Um, and I would go on to the next slide, which points out that we do allow exceptions if it's just not possible to meet that standard. Um, we prefer not to relax the standard for a long distance but we have done upwards of a mile of a relaxed standard uh, where we're going through an established town. Um, and we have uh, also the provision that allows for either the fence or a dense vegetative barrier. On the barrier, the critical part is to make sure that uh, the, it's not easy to trespass across the tracks or walk along the, the ties. Um, and especially for kids, for some reason, train tracks have a, they, they create a fascination for, for kids. Um, now on a special exception basis, we will allow a distance, separation distance of 20 feet and, and we have done that in, in some cases. Let's go to the next slide. My advice as both a railroad owner and also as a very active bicyclist and, and trail development uh, advocate is to learn which type of railroad owner you must deal with. I'm using that terminology class one railroad to refer to national or at least multi-state ownership. A regional railroad is often a multi-state system, uh, but shorter in length and um, very different from a short line railroad. The ownership of a short line railroad is typically local. So it's important for trail uh, supporters and trail project uh, managers to understand the railroad management structure. You need to start at the senior management level if at all possible and try to find a sympathetic ear. That's not going to be easy. And I understand there are a fair number of people from the East Coast or Pennsylvania on this webinar. And in the case of Norfolk Southern, my recommendation is for you to start with Rudy Husband. Uh, uh, and it's rudy.husband at nscorp.com. And feel free to use the fact that I have recommended that you talk to him. Uh, that may not get, get you very much, but at least you'll, you'll, you'll understand why you're talking to him directly. Going to the next slide. Um, I, my advice would be that you try to understand who owns the railroad and it may be different as to who owns the right-of-way. And you need to also do your homework to see if a rail banking agreement exists. 
and by all means review that agreement. It should be posted in your tax records or in your court recorder uh, structure, depending on your county government's uh, structure. And then my recommendation, and this is very important, make contact with the railroad management before there's any publicity on the proposed trail that might involve the railroad. And as Kelly had mentioned a couple minutes ago, uh, there are a number of state laws that do provide protection um, for private, private landowners which do allow recreational use on their property. We have one such law in Pennsylvania. Um, now, the, the not all of those state laws specifically refer to railroads, but I believe Kelly mentioned that two recently have added railroads specifically. And that's, that's one of the things that, uh, as trail advocates, it would be helpful if you get your legislature to add railroads in specifically for that uh, recreational use immunity protection. Um, next slide, please. Um, in the negotiation with a railroad, try to offer the opportunity for meaningful involvement of the railroad in the trail route planning. And by all means, try to come into those discussions and interactions with mutual respect, understanding that railroads are primary targets for lawsuits, so they are defensive. I'll give an example. Uh, we had a train crew, or a maintenance crew, that was replacing cross ties. And at the end of the day, they had a, a small part of a a truckload left, uh, so they unloaded those so they could get a full truckload back at their yard to re resume their maintenance work the next day. That night, 10.30 at night, here comes an ATV rider with no headlights, 10.30 at night, and he hits the stack of, of uh, spare ties and flips, breaks his neck, hurts his spine, and now he is suing us. Uh, and it's not uncommon for railroads to be sued by trespassers, but that you know, there's a lot of cost involved in defending ourselves as railroads and a huge amount of aggravation connected with that. And often, in the court of public opinion, uh, people are more prone to side with the, the poor unfortunate fellow who got hurt uh, even if, even though he was trespassing. Uh, next slide, please. I also would recommend in your negotiations with the railroad that you allow generous time for the railroad to review draft or schematic trail route and design. And presume that you are going to have greater difficulty getting a railroad to agree to at-grade crossing. Uh, At-grade crossings are the primary location where the most accidents occur. Uh, and it's far preferable to have public, have the trail go across public at-grade crossings, which are regulated by your public utilities commission in each state, than to try to negotiate private at-grade crossings. But uh, try to avoid those at-grade crossings when possible. And um, one of the important features in your trail design is to use different techniques to prevent ATV access onto the railroad right of way or even the trail itself. And critical behind this, and many people don't understand it, but a, a loaded 100 car train is over a mile long and it needs a half a mile or more stopping distance even at a speed of 30 to 40 miles per hour. So you just can't expect that engineer to avoid an accident even if they can see uh, a, a trespasser or, or someone that's occupying the tracks. Um, next slide please. Um, in the negotiation with the railroad do your best to design a trail with a permanent barrier between the train and the trail. 
um, that are childproof. Um, one other really important thing to offer to the railroad is that you would arrange through who's, who's ever going to own the trail that there would be competent, regular uh, trail inspections, and especially at all track crossings, um, and that you would offer to share the inspection results with the railroad if asked. In fact, I would advise that if you have an advisory committee uh, all working on your trail project, um, include a railroad representative on that trail advisory committee. That will go a long way to having them be able to express their concerns and have those conditions uh, incorporated or at least have them understand why it just won't work to do exactly what they would like ideally. Um, also, as part of your negotiation with the railroad, offer to provide a trail owner or trail person point of contact that would be available 24-7, 365 days a year who would have the authority to close the trail and dispatch an emergency repair crew or mobilize volunteers to correct the safety hazard where there's a trail or and railroad interface. And some railroads may go so far as to require indemnification. Next slide, please. Here's a, an example of one of our four completed projects so far. This is on the at the end of the 65-mile Pine Creek Rail Trail in western Lycoming County. And you can see the Lycoming Valley Railroad on the right. This is coming from the parking lot. Next slide. And you can see the, the painted railroad crossing signs giving forewarning to the bicyclist and the walker. By the way, you can notice the fence on both sides. Next slide. This is that trail crossing of the Lacombe Valley Railroad. And again, you can see techniques there to alert even the vision impaired trail user to uh, that there's a, a crossing. Next slide. Uh, then you can see the fence that uh, is used to separate the trail from the railroad tracks. And you can notice that this is closer than the minimum separation distance that's in the policy. Moving farther east to the city of Williamsport, in the next slide, here is a, a public at grade crossing uh, still on our Lycoming Valley Railroad going over to a parking lot. Um, and this case, the, tra the uh, crossing is a public crossing for vehicles to go to a uh, pump station facility for the dike levy system um, as well as that parking lot you see in the background. Uh, next slide please. Um, you'll, you should also uh, cooperate on your trail to allow uh, these uh, crossing emergency notification signs because that will help to make the railroad feel much better about any emergency that needs to be reported instantly. Next slide, please. Um, here is a, another view. And one of the interesting things is that the Susquehanna River Walk is alongside that fence up on top of the levee along the Susquehanna River. And that is above, up on top of the dike. And you see cars in the background. Our rail authority has allowed a 91-car parking lot and special events lot to be placed on our railroad property because we do have a fence between uh, the parking lot and the tracks. So I believe that that um, should get us started with, uh, and, and my contact uh, information is then on the following final slide. Back to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that. I'm going to turn it over now to Mark out in Arizona. Please bear with me while we uh, Switch screen control here. Hello, this is Mark Pearsall. Uh, do you see my screen? 
Yep, we got it, Mark. Great. Thank you. Uh, appreciate all of you uh, permitting us to share our uh, experiences here with our, some of our studies and our ongoing work. Myself, uh, Mark Pearsall, and Eric Iverson of Tempe. This is uh, just a summary of our, uh, uh, our efforts with the bicycle and pedestrian pathway railroad crossing recommendations work that we had done uh, a couple of years ago. Um, just again, a quick overview, the background, project need, RECO's uh, crossing design, our test case, and the, uh, the best takeaway was our process checklist, which we hope uh, many of you might be able to um, take a look at and utilize locally. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of that as we go. Again, uh, what we have here uh, basically, again, is uh, how did we get here? But just a little quick background. Uh, Metropolitan Phoenix, uh, the MAG region, has a, 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 a quite a few hundred-year-old system of canals that are now modernized. And many of those canals are privately owned. They're owned by Salt River Project, which is our, uh, one of our utilities. Those canals cross railroad tracks, um, but they are not uh, crossings that are considered uh, in the national database. They're not official sanctioned crossings. They're considered private, not public. So they lack the, uh, as you would expect, they, they lack the pertinent uh, grade crossing treatment, um, cross bucks, um, stop signs, gates, lights, things that you would expect at a crossing. So we were invited to uh, to look into the subject for six of these crossings by the agencies that we represent, um, Chandler, Tempe, uh, si uh, Town of Gilbert. As you can see here at the top, uh, from October through uh, of 12 through February of 14, we engaged in a uh, study to look at them with a test case uh, at the Western Canal Crossing, which I'll show you here. At the bottom of the slide, of course, is just some history of uh, the railroad through the East Valley. As you can see, the, uh, the canal uh, pathway system in the valley over the last few decades, um, and in particular the last few years, has gotten quite popular as our uh, regional county trail system has uh, been improved. Uh, it's one of the largest in North America, um, and uh, we take a lot of pride in it. And as you can see here, just the crossing traffic with bicycle counts uh, has gone up substantially at quite a few of these uh, crossings. As I mentioned, it focused primarily on the private canal crossings in the East Valley. We, we did open it up canvas-wise to look at the entire valley, but we realized that there were only indeed uh, private crossings in the Southeast Valley, so that actually helped kind of hone our uh, projects down in its scope. Uh, the railroads in the Northwest and the Southwest Valley don't have any private crossings at this that actually helped us out. Project team included Salt River Project, Arizona Department of Transportation, uh, Arizona Corporation Commission, which is basically our agency that oversees grade crossings and Operation Lifesaver, a nationally renowned um, railroad safety organization. Here's a map of the area that we looked at with the, um, excuse me, it was seven crossings, not, um, not six, I apologize. These are the crossings, the private crossings that we looked at. All of them traverse Union Pacific uh, mainline and branch lines. Number seven being our test case that we wanted to take through to 15% uh, project guidelines and standards so that the city could take them further with their contractor and actually build the treatment. Kind of some photographs here of where the, uh, the trails meet the crossings. Um, as you can see the, on the left photo, there's one of the canals there. Uh, again, a lot of the neighborhoods are right up against the trackway. Because they are private crossings, uh, what they do have is they have a, a, a private stop sign, which is actually um, uh, Federal Railroad Administration, and I believe MUTCD requires this for private crossings. And these were some of the uh, signage, uh, again, that folks, a lot of cyclists, um, like all of us, uh, can be impatient, and they'll blow right through that stop sign, which causes some consternation from the railroads, um, which is, again, one of the reasons why we're looking at safety. Again, just some factoids here on uh, project need and, of course, uh, uh, pedestrians. Uh, now with a lot of people with earbuds and headsets, um, we experience this here with our light rail system where folks have got their head down. Um, they're either looking at their iPod or their iPad, excuse me, or their phone, 
uh, they're kind of in their own world, so there's a, there's a great disconnect between being aware of your surroundings um, and putting yourself in harm's way. Another thing, too, is some of these crossings, there is a visual impediment. Because the neighborhoods and the walls of these neighborhoods come so close to the crossings, a lot of cyclists can be right on top of the rail before they can look left or look right to see an oncoming train. Two of these lines, the track speeds are relatively low. They're at, uh, at um, uh, 10 to 20 mile an hour. But one of the main lines that you see in the Far East Valley has a top speed of 60. And so that's, that's created some concern as well. Uh, part of the spirit behind this study was, again, to establish some sort of, of rudimentary standard that we could go to. As, um, as Kelly had mentioned, there is no uh, you know, rails to trails or, 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 or uh, if you will, for dummies. There is a, uh, um, it's, it's kind of what we all learn and share with each other. So the thought was to be able to use a design guideline that we create from this study uh, with input from some of the, uh, the guides you see here. Now, one of the things we've heard from the railroads is, again, where feasible, implement a grade-separated crossing. The problem with a lot of these areas is that, uh, other than one of them, where there will be a pedestrian bridge because there's a nearby industry, um, there's no physical way to implement a grade separation or a bridge without severe visual and environmental impacts to the neighborhood. You've got limited right-of-way. There are power lines above, um, and there may not be the amount of traffic from the cycling and ped community to warrant a grade separation. So the idea was to work with the railroad to get the, the best of both worlds for both the railroad and the public. Uh, when we worked with Union Pacific, at the time they had basically a rule of thumb guideline for all of us, which was if you want to open up a brand new grade crossing, you've got to close two existing crossings. They view Union Pacific in particular viewed converting a private crossing to a public crossing as a new crossing, which created quite a pickle for us because it's not really new. It's just a conversion to make it safer. They, they actually kind of changed their mind on the closed existing crossings to open up a new one for us at the time. Um, they realized that there aren't really any existing crossings that can be closed in the Southeast Valley because all of them are rather substantial arterials and, and secondary streets. So this is where both parties at the very bottom here, you can see ad address crossings on a case-by-case -case basis. These crossings are unique like children. They have their own personalities. And so moving forward, we agreed that each one would, would kind of have to uh, use the, the guidelines, but there might be some pros and cons of some specifics that we could uh, uh, utilize to customize them. So out of this came the checklist. And these are zoom-ins of the checklist that we used from step one, I think, through step nine. Um, at, the, at the end of this seminar, or at the end of this PowerPoint, there is a link that you can click that will take you to the MAG website where you can look at the study that Eric and I had worked on with Alex Orishek, my predecessor, um, that goes into great detail on, uh, on how we did this and how you can utilize the um, checklist. And it's universal, um, as you can see. Step two, determine if the crossing is public or private. A lot of this adheres really to things that Jerry had just mentioned on the phone, that he's got real-world experience with this sort of thing, and we wanted to put it down on paper. So step three, determine recommended crossing infrastructure. This is, of course, working with the railroad. Preliminary cost estimates. Identify your partners. Actually, and we would identify partners really before step one, but be that as it may, here it is. Step six, official dialogue. Seven is construction phase, and here's our flow chart. Um, this is also in the report. It really just kind of takes you from step one all the way through, and, and as you go to the right and down, your, your requirements for the crossing become more in-depth and more expensive. So at, at five, over at the far right, you'll notice that the treatments below in the far lower right corner are signage and crossbook, pavement markings, channelization, flashing lights, automobile signal, and automatic pedestrian gates. That would be some of the crossings that you all have in your communities that would require all of it. 
Um, and then again, some only require a signage or a crossbuck and pavement markings, which are some of the treatments we're going to be using. Again, here's some zoom ins on that flowchart. Here's some crossing designs where we, we have passive warning and active warning, which some of you are familiar with. Here's passive, which again is signage, pavement, tactile strips, fencing, and gates. Active, flashers, audible, automated gates, maze barriers. Really, these are Z gates that many of you have seen where it forces you to walk in the direction, to walk left at an angle to see oncoming train traffic to your left, forces you to walk right, so you visually see traffic coming from your right. Then you walk um, straight across the tracks. And then, of course, variable messaging signs. So this is kind of an aerial of our test case. Uh, it is the border between the uh, city of Chandler and the town of Gilbert. It's a part of our vast Sun Circle Trail. Uh, one of the, in fact, uh, Eric's on the phone, but he he can't he can't talk to me right now. But I believe the Sun Circle Trail is the the largest uh, metropolitan trail in North America in in length. Um, you can see it's a branch line, low train volume, low train speeds. Um, it's a discontinuous pathway. This is back when the communities weren't really working with each other. So to the left, you can see where Chandler built right up to the end of their right of way. And then Gilbert on the right built at an angle because it envisioned kind of being further away from the uh, canal. So we're addressing that with our treatment. Through uh, the regulatory or the design recommendations, the input from the railroad, you can see all the things that the railroad recommended. Um, and here is a 15% design plan of exactly, and I'll zoom in on it here in a moment, some of the treatments we're making. There it is. So it's got a mix of everything. Um, right now, as it stands, the railroad is, they've, they've had some second thoughts on some of these treatments. Um, they're working with the cities to kind of amend them. Uh, there is still a, uh, this is a funded program through our regional um, uh, project uh, pot. Uh, the railroad is aware of it, and the city has a schedule. The hope is to get this in, I believe, sometime between 18 and 19. And again, to use it as a test case for further uh, projects around the valley, of which um, one of them is the Alameda Crossing, um, where Eric uh, is working on that right now. Um, in addition to some other uh, improvements along the Kyrene line. So if I may, I'm going to hand the audible over to Eric, and then I'll uh, control the uh, PowerPoint from here. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully uh, you can hear me. This is... This is Eric Iverson. I'm, uh, thank you, Mark. I'm, this is Eric Iverson. I'm with uh, City of Tempe, Arizona. It's part of the uh, Maricopa Association of Governments uh, region, and uh, we do work really closely with Mark and his his cohorts there at uh, um, at that Council of Governments. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history on on Tempe and uh, some of the unique uh, features that we have related to rail as well as just our transportation system. So the image that you see in front of you is um, the yellow line indicates where we have an at-grade crossing that has been in existence for approximately 30 years. Um, we have in Tempe um, approximately, we have 10 to 12, depending upon how you count them, uh, informal crossings uh, like this um, in Tempe uh, in and around our community. We have. Um, Ten locations that uh, show up in our transportation plan, our long-range transportation plan, uh, as wanting to have grade-separated or at-grade uh, bicycle-pedestrian crossing solutions. Um, so we, uh, this, this is the only crossing that you see in front of you. This is the only crossing that we have in Tempe that's actually um, a part of the statewide approved collection of such crossings. So, um, like previous speakers have said, we work with the Arizona Corporation Commission um, that has oversight over uh, over the railroad and these uh, these types of facilities. So we do have a close relationship with them. In addition to uh, ADOT, our utility companies, and MAG, you can see with this particular crossing, um, as as other speakers have also mentioned, that. 
comes with other challenges uh, like utilities. Um, we have overhead power lines here that um, you know present unique constraints when you're talking about uh, you know requests from the railroad to do things like a like a grade separated crossing. Um, Tempe is a strong bicycle pedestrian community where we are a college. Uh, city with Arizona State University. We have the highest bicycle commuting percentage in the state of Arizona. Uh, and, and our city council and community, community has been really dedicated to um, making a transportation system that, that has strong bicycle facilities. And as such, um, it's, as we've developed our system citywide, it has put increasing pressure on uh, the railroad uh, and, and uh, getting access across and adjacent to it. Um, we have uh, approximately um, 15 miles, a little bit more, of railroad in the city that goes right through the heart of our downtown and um, north and south and east and west um, through the community. So it connects and divides many parts of the city. Um, I will uh, go to the next slide to talk more specifically about uh, this Alameda crossing and some of the challenges we have going forward and some of the opportunities we have going forward. This is an aerial of the crossing. You can see that um, on the east side or one side of it, we have single family residential that's about 50 years old in the community, um, sort of classic suburban development. And then on the west side, on the left side of the screen, we have a um, one square mile um, industrial park uh, that's, a, that's heavily uh, utilized. It's um, very active in our community. It's a, it's a um, big employment center. We have um, new companies moving in and kind of revitalizing that area. And so we have a lot of folks that are walking and biking and using this crossing to get to and from those neighborhoods to that employment center. The neighborhoods to the, to the east are actually connected to ASU and very close to, to downtown Tempe and Alameda Drive, uh, the street that, that uh, this railroad uh, bisects and where this, uh, this connection, uh, this bike ped connection is. Alameda Drive is a, is a strong, uh, it's a collector street, but it's a strong bicycle, pedestrian, and transit street. So um, puts, again, more pressure on this crossing to be improved and uh, to continue having it as a, as a uh, successful link in our system. I will add, I forgot to mention in the last uh, slide that we had um, this agreement that we have for this particular crossing was struck with the previous owner of the railroad, Southern Pacific, Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, when Union Pacific took over ownership of the railroads in Tempe uh, and in this region, um, they they had to recognize uh, that previous agreement with Southern Pacific. So uh, next slide. Um, so the the details of that um, agreement that was struck in 1991 outlined a certain design that we wouldn't do today, um, but still exists today, and we can't change it uh, without. Um, jeopardizing the agreement that we have uh, to keep this crossing as a as a legal crossing, so it doesn't meet you know by by standards of ADA or or AASHTO or NACTO bicycle pedestrian design. It doesn't it doesn't meet those those uh, current standards, but um, nonetheless, people you know obviously people do use it. Um, it's pretty apparent with this visual. You can see some of the challenges. There's there's no room to to. Uh, it's, you have to be very careful anyway, and very clever to get a, a wheelchair access through here, um, as well as as uh, sort of forcing a, a dismount operation for for a bicyclist. Um, this does go back to uh, 1991, <laughs> and then this next image is actually um, just looking uh, looking west. It's an image from the neighborhood, so you can see the conditions are pretty close. Um, closely mirroring on, on both sides. The pavement condition right at the tracks is actually um, uh, deteriorating and, and not great. It's usable, but uh, um, not, not in ideal conditions. And I think we can uh, move past this one. Um, so these are, this is a little bit more uh, detail of, of some of the existing conditions. And um, this slide is actually taken from a larger project that we have um, going on in Tempe, a larger three-mile streetscape project to, um, to look at enhancing the environment on all of Alameda Drive, which again connects to um, some of our stronger, older 
single-family neighborhoods, connects to ASU and, and downtown Tempe, as well as to employment destinations east and west um, along this alignment. So we have federal funding to do a streetscape project in this whole alignment. Right in the heart of this streetscape alignment is this crossing. We have worked, as Mark mentioned, with MAG and with, with uh, Union Pacific Railroad to come up with a 15% um, design for improving this at-grade crossing, and this would be an active, um, you know, we're looking at having lights and, and, um, and other more active solutions to, to how we address the, the improvements to this crossing. We do, again, have um, the, the support of the railroad at this point, we realize that every every step we take towards towards implementation does uh, present new challenges, uh, and and um, you know so we we are careful to keep a good working relationship with Union Pacific. It's an important relationship to us, and we are confident that with this larger streetscape project, the federal funding that we have with it, and this early support of Union Pacific to do a improved crossing here, that we will in fact. Uh, get that get that upgraded crossing to happen and keep it as an at grade solution. So you can see those those active design elements listed here in the um, in the details of this slide. You know, including the new pavement markings, um, uh, new pavement, flashing lights, and an audible device. All the kind of standard stuff that we've come up with as part of the of the MAG document that Mark talked about earlier. Next slide. Uh, this is we wanted to provide you all with some of the um, the uh, documents that showed what we agreed upon um, back in 1991. Uh, and these were you know these again were approved and um, and supported by the Corporation Commission, uh, ADOT, and uh, Southern Pacific at the time, and they are recognized. Uh, these these deals were were um, struck by the city, but they were recognized by Southern Pacific and continue to be recognized by Union Pacific. Next slide. So we also have in, in Tempe um, two, we have again two, two main, uh, we have a spur line and we have a main line, uh, about 15 miles of track, uh, active rail track in Tempe. We also have a, um, a, a two mile section of track that was abandoned um, years ago and, and a portion of that track has been utilized for what is today our, our uh, um, regional light rail system, and we have a half mile of that abandoned track that is, is currently being converted to two-way pathway um, in one of our older parts of the community. But for the, for the longest portion of, of uh, track in Tempe, um, which runs north and south in our city from, from city limit to city limit, so on the south end, um, you can see a map here of, of a, you know, a, a straight line that runs basically adjacent to our, um, what we call the north-south rail spur. It connects to Chandler on the south end and connects to um, our Phoenix border on the north end. Uh, we're a city right in the middle of the valley, so it does connect to these two cities. We have received federal funding to, um, to do five miles of this seven miles of pathway adjacent to the, the active rail line. So um, we have portions of this, prop, of this project that will be required to, um, to look at going on to uh, Union Pacific land. Um, but for most of this project that you're seeing in front of you, we will be building this on, uh, adjacent to uh, the railroad with appropriate safety measures. And here, here's some visuals of how that looks um, into the future. Uh, but we will be designing it such that um, we stay off of the railroad right away for 95 percent of the percent of it in those those and then in those other locations we will have to work on agreements but um, the image on your lower left shows an alignment um, next to the railroad tracks on right away that's owned by the city so it is um, what was previously going to be a widened road and now we are not widening the road and, and looking to have bike pen improvements and then we actually have a portion of this rail that was that was done for two short city blocks sort of as a demonstration project but we worked with a private developer in our downtown and we did we've done one portion of of a rail trail um, paved pathway with lighting and landscaping that's adjacent to some multifamily housing that um, is in our downtown. So this, this image on the top right is what we want to uh, continue in our relationship with UP and the private development and city right away for that entire seven mile north south rail spur pathway. We feel really, um, it, this, this project has been really, really well received by the community and we feel um, we will continue to have that relationship going forward with other miles of this pathway. Next slide. 
And with that, I think we're, we will uh, leave you with the reference to the document that uh, Mark talked about and our contact information, uh, including uh, the uh, gentleman, Brian Sager, who we worked with to develop the, uh, the, the MAG document as well as the North-South Rail Spur concept plans that you saw earlier uh, specifically for the um, uh, rail trail improvement in, in Tempe. Thanks, Eric. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark and Eric. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over right now to Matt Mihalovich out in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So again, be with me as we switch screen control. Looks like you're good to go, Matt. Okay, thank you, Eli. Um, my name is Matt Mihalovich. I'm a land tech, and I'm the trails coordinator for the city of Fayetteville. And uh, this slide shows kind of where Fayetteville is for those of you that aren't familiar with the area, but we're tucked in the northwest corner of Arkansas. Um, we have recently completed a Razorback Regional Greenway, which is a 37-mile uh, trail that goes through all of northwest Arkansas, and the uh, start of it, the zero point, is actually uh, in Fayetteville. Uh, Fayetteville is the home of the University of Arkansas and a, a progressive city as far as uh, biking and uh, trail infrastructure and strong citizen support for that. Uh, we're also a bronze bicycle friendly community um, and so we've been working hard to get more and more trails and it's really expanded throughout the region uh, in recent years. As I mentioned, the Razorback uh, Regional Greenway actually opened a year ago. It's about a, it's going to be a year old in May. Uh, 37 miles, and here's kind of a zoom in in the, in the Fayetteville portion, uh, pretty much runs north-south uh, through the center of the city. Um, we had already built portions of that, uh, this trail, um, and, and actually completed it in 2008 and called it the, the Frisco Trail. So I'll refer to it also, especially the sections downtown as the Frisco Trail as well. It kind of has both names. Uh, but about nine miles of the Razorback Regional Greenway come through Fayetteville. A um, little bit of a zoom in in Fayetteville, the, the blue lines uh, show our existing trail network. Um, we're at 40 miles of existing trails. Um, and that's really all started about in the last 10 to 12 years. Um, I've been working on it for about 11 years. And um, some of the things that's made it possible is that we actually have a, a crew that's dedicated to construction of the trails that works uh, for the city through our um, public works department. Uh, so they're dedicated to building uh, the nine-member crew that builds the trails. So we brought all that in-house to the city. Um, as we lay out our master plan, which is over 100 miles of trails on the master plan, um, it mostly follows the creeks, which is pretty typical of, of a lot of master plans. But our creek corridor also follows the Arkansas-Missouri Railroad uh, corridor. So this map shows the places where those interact, the trail and uh, the railroad. Um, we were just talking about all the crossings. Um, we've been fortunate to be able to use grade-separated crossings, um, really primarily, uh, pretty much all of them are, are grade-separated, where there was an existing trestle uh, that we were able to pass under following the creek. Um, so they, uh, the exception is down along Dixon Street, we got into more of an urban area and uh, just, just really didn't have the, the uh, space to, to put the trail through this urban, uh, more downtown uh, Dixon Street area is near the University of Arkansas. It's also our entertainment district. Um, so uh, the, the, the right of way for the railroad, I should mention, is only 50 feet total. So that's all the, that's all the railroad owned, and then beyond that was developed uh, with with buildings and different things and parking lots. So um, you'll see that we are very close to the rail line, um, much closer than where uh, Jerry was showing in some of the standards um, for them. The good thing is too that we have a, a low volume. Uh, this is a short line railroad that is low volume, about four trains a day come through Fayetteville and a fairly slow rate of speed. Uh, a little bit about the railroad uh, itself, it's a, called the Arkansas-Missouri Railroad. Um, it's part of a, the old Frisco railway system. So the tracks are built in the 1880s, a very old uh, track, but pretty spectacular views as they come through the Boston Mountains and some big trestles and tunnels. Um, I wanted to mention the tunnel. It, it actually kind of is beneficial to some of the proximity that our trail is to the track because it's already a constraint for wide loads of, on the rail. Um, it's very tight, as you can see uh, currently. And so that was a restriction. That's, that's located about 20 miles south of Fayetteville. Um, Arkansas Missouri Railroad is established in 1886, or 1986, sorry. 
uh, the class three about 150 miles from Monet uh, to Fort Smith. So you kind of see uh, Fayetteville is right in here, about halfway. Um, we have a 99-year lease that we worked out with the railroad. It um, took about two years to get <laughs> put together, um, and we were able to complete it in, in uh, 2008. It was up, it was upgraded again in about 2012 to add a couple more spots uh, that we wanted to cross the railroad. Uh, some of their uh, requirements were a six-foot decorative fence um, between the trail and the railroad, and that's located actually about 10 feet from the center of the tracks. Um, in areas where we cross under the trestles, uh, they required a freestanding roof, which we thought was a good idea as well, uh, and also signage uh, telling the public that it is illegal to trespass on, their, on the railroad tracks. Um, originally, they wanted us to provide uh, indemnification um, for the for this area, and our city attorney was not a, basically as a city, local government. We are not able to extend that indemnification to the railroad, and so we ended up settling on an insurance policy of five million dollars of public liability and property damage insurance. Uh, it cost the city about six thousand dollars a year to keep that going. Uh, here's shows some exhibits of where how we wrote the easement and, and actually the legal descriptions of where uh, where it is. In general, it begins about eight feet from the center of tracks and uh, can kind of extend out to about 25 feet from center of tracks, which is their, the right-of-way line of the railroad. A little bit of history here. Um, this, and this is the, the Dixon Street area, which is what I was talking about earlier, more of the entertainment district. Um, and. You can see here, this is what it looked like in 2010 when we were really planning the trail. And you can see right through here, we just we saw this opportunity to, to put in the trail. And so that's what it looks like today. Um, as, and it's, it's used by about 1,000 users a day on the trail. So experiencing heavy use. Um, wanted to mention one of the things that we brought to the table uh, for the railroad, which I think really helped with negotiations, is, is they had a problem with people previously walking on the tracks uh, especially after a late night at Dixon Street and coming back and maybe not making the best decisions. And there were actually a few incidents over the years where there was people struck with the train. So we were able to provide to them saying, we'll provide a facility, we'll build it, uh, that will that will encourage people to use the trail instead of the railroad tracks. And that has been the case. Uh, we just don't really see anybody on the, on the tracks anymore. They'd much rather use the trail lighting, uh, has really just taken care of that problem. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the proximity, uh, I think we're, we're some of the closest probably that you'll see. Um, nine feet is probably the, is the tightest area. Um, a federal, I looked at the Federal Railroad Administration and it says eight feet is the, the closest, so we're, we're in compliance with that for obstructions by fences and things. Um, and they are able, this is a piece of maintenance equipment, they're able to get in there. This sign is actually closer than the fencing and uh, it hasn't been hit. Uh, we do have a bridge next to it in one place down as you can see. Uh, some more pictures. Here's the sign that we're required to, uh, to install and the, the canopy roof, just in case debris falls off the tracks as they're going over. Another view of downtown here. This is looking north. This is our old depot. Uh, so looking north from Dixon Street before. And another spot of looking to the south. I, I think it was supposed to show. Oh, I'm sorry about that. There we go. So now the trail is in. 12-foot wide trail um, with lighting. So I wanted to mention, too, that we've, we've continued a partnership um, with the railroad, the Arkansas Missouri Railroad, and actually recently upgraded the crossing. The signalized crossing there was uh, from the 1960s and was not, not very um, up-to-date. And so uh, we did a cost-share agreement to put standardized, modernized gates and uh, and signal an audible warning at the, the crossing, which also protects the sidewalk. It required us to move the trail a little bit. We ended up shifting it to your, the right on the screen. Um, but it worked out really well, and it was a good partnership uh, to increase the safety of the area. Um, one other thing that's been great is that with the, the relationship with the railroad is they've actually seen it as an opportunity. They, they are an excursion railroad, excursion and freight, um, but they uh, saw the opportunity to actually transport bikes on the on the railroad because it runs right along the Razorback Greenway as it goes on through Northwest Arkansas. Um, so as you can see here, the people are. This was our opening day about a year ago, 
um, and they're loading the bikes on the on the train. And they've done it on several different occasions and big events and, and different times to try to see if there's interest in people going one way on the on the trail and then be able to load their bikes on the tra train and come back to Fayetteville and uh, different destinations. So overall, you know, it was a challenge, I would say, uh, certainly is, and, and you know, finding the right people to work with. Uh, in this case, uh, the railroad's attorney is who we primarily work with, and he was a trail supporter. So we had that on our side. And then, as I mentioned before, bringing uh, to the table the the safety issue that they had down there uh, and that we brought a solution to that. So by with doing those two things and then the insurance was a critical component. So we were able to reach an agreement and uh, we have the 99 year lease in place and uh, we've been enjoying a good relationship. So I hope this presents a, a successful example of at least what other communities can do with it with a short line railroad. I know it gets uh, more difficult with the bigger railroads, but uh, this is a, uh, was a good success overall. So. With that, I'll turn it back over to Eli, I guess. Thank you so much, Matt, and to all of our panelists. That concludes our scheduled presentations, leaving us with about 20 minutes to tackle as many of these great questions as we've been receiving um, as possible. So let me just work here to switch my screen right over. Okay, great. And Matt, since you just wrapped up, uh, I'll pose the first question to you. Um, it's from Mark Pasco, and he wants to know um, whether the speed of the train through Fayetteville, the, the fact that it's slow, um, informs the 9 to 10 foot short um, uh, clearance from the center line requirement. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that that, that is a consideration of, of the, the, the close proximity, but it wasn't a, a real big talking point. Um, they go about 25 miles an hour at most through here, um, but but yeah, I mean, it, more they, they just really didn't have a concern with it, um, the railroad, surprisingly. I mean, I think because of that tunnel, they already had restrictions, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was allowable. And they, and then they knew we only had 25 feet total to work with, um, so with a 12-foot trail, you know, there's just not much left. But I think that the speed does, does help us out. The, the low Great, speed. thanks, Matt. And actually, we have another one here for you from Champ Burnley, and I think um, you can take the first stab at it, and I think Kelly's going to jump in at the end. But he wants to know if there have ever been any injuries or lawsuits related to the Frisco Trail. Uh, no, not since the trail has been in. As I mentioned, those incidents early on, it was just the railroad, there were there were some. But uh, since then, uh, you know, actually one car, a car was hit at Dixon Street and um, by the by the train, she wasn't paying attention. It pushed pushed the car into our fence and knocked it down, but it wasn't anything related with the trail. Um, so since, knock on wood, since the trail has been in place, um, we've seen a, a real shift from, from pedestrians and, and users just not using the track to walk and using the trail and uh, and being in safe safe area. Uh, one thing too, if they were inside the fencing area, we do have enough space for any, anybody to stand away from the the train and still be able to be safely away from the train uh, in against the fence. So that was one of our concerns as we looked at the proximity, you know, to have enough room for somebody to stand there. They were kind of caught in that area. But yeah, knock on wood, not not anything. We've, we've not had any issues. We've not had to use our entrance yet. Hopefully never. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, and, and kind of as a follow-up question from Jennifer Wampler, and I'm going to direct this to Kelly. Um, she wants to know if there were any lawsuits associated with the two, uh, the two known fatalities along rail with trails. So Kelly? Yeah, sure. Hi, Jennifer. Um, so just to frame the, those fatalities a little bit more and give people some more context, both uh, the fatalities in Bellingham, Washington, and in Santa Fe, New Mexico, occurred at, on at-grade crossing. So it was where the rail with trail intersected with an active right-of-way. In both cases, there were cyclists who were struck um, uh, in the corridor. And um, in both cases, all of the warning signals were activated. Um, in Santa Fe, the emergency stop was activated as well. Um, but in, in both cases, neither cyclist um, attempted or 
to stop. Um, so it's just important to know that those, again, those fatalities occurred at, at grade crossings. They, there have been no reported fatalities that we know of that have occurred on the rail with trail that's parallel to to the active rail line. Um, in the Bellingham, Washington case, a, lo a lawsuit was filed against the railroad and the trail manager, but neither was found liable. And interestingly, the court specifically noted that the trail crossing that, that was existing there had actually improved safety for pedestrians and, and bicyclists. Um, and then in the Santa Fe case, no law lawsuit was filed as of July 2015. So as of a year after the incident, no lawsuit was filed. But um, the victim's family you know, said that they were interested in petitioning the state to install, install safety gates across the trail. So where there was um, signalized safety gates on the parallel roadway that um, was running next to the trail, as it made a 90 degree crossing uh, along the active rail. There, there's not a signalized crossing there for the cyclist. They, they would just hear or see the, the signal from the roadway. Um, but no, so there, there have, have been um, no lawsuits filed where either the railroad or the trail manager was found liable. Um, and, and hopefully that, you know, kind of gives you a better sense, too, of, of what types of incidents and, and things that we can be working on to maybe improve in design standards when we're looking at uh, at grade crossings. Eli. Great. Go ahead, Jerry. Um, this is Jerry Walls. Um, I'd just like to uh, point out a, a clarification that um, not all railroads are the same as as it, in one case the tunnel there uh, imposes a constraint on what I would call oversized loads, particularly wide loads. But uh, for example, our railroad has just hauled a humongous portion of a new natural gas-fired power plant, and that in itself is too big to go on a highway. It has to be hauled by rail. So you've got to be aware that this is one of those kinds of things that railroads are jealously trying to make sure they they have the they don't have a constraint put in front of them that would keep them from being able to take those big wide loads that are obviously very profitable for them. Thank you, Jerry. And since I have you here, I'll post the next one to you. This is also from Champ Burnley. Um, he wants to know if, uh, since building rails with trails, have you seen an increase or a decrease of uh, trespass or casualties? We have seen a decrease in those locations where we have a an easy to use trail uh, that is along the railroad. Um, a lot of like Combing County and North Central Pennsylvania where our railroads run is very rural. The bigger problem is the ATV trespass and that is uh, very difficult to deal with um, out in a rural area. Great, thanks Terry. Um, the next one is for Mark and Eric, and David Smith wants to know if you guys are working with a local Union Pacific uh, representative or with someone at headquarters, and maybe you can expand on that to talk a little bit about how your relationship has been. Uh, excellent question. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, we. It, it started with uh, going basically to the local government relations uh, person. She's actually no longer there, but she's she's got a, a, a successor who's based out of El Paso. Um, and then we through through her we began to work with the, the lo one of the basically the local grade crossing representative um, who works he himself works directly with Arizona DOT and Arizona Corporation Commission on inventorying, managing, maintaining, opening and closing grade crossings. So we brought him in actually early on as a paid um, 
consultant, if you will. The railroad requested that we, um, we give them billable hours for their time, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But we brought him in from beginning through the end, and he worked with us um, throughout, uh, offering comments and, and clearances and, um, and, and input from not only his department and, and uh, the, uh, the team that he works for out of Roseville, California, but also out of Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and um, one of the reasons why we were requested to pay them was during kind of the, the heady days of the first Tiger grants that came out um, between 08 and maybe 10, 11, the railroad was being, they told us, was being inundated from, from every community across the country to do a special study or help them out with a particular program. And they basically said that, you know, all that time that their staff spent, only probably five to 10% of those projects actually ever got built or came to fruition. So they basically wanted to make sure that the time that their employees spent with um, public agency employees was no different than maybe something we would spend on a consultant ourselves. So because we were willing to pay, and it wasn't a lot of money, it was just a you know, few thousand dollars of billable hours over a year, they took us seriously. Um, the downside is, is that once we got through all of this and made recommendations and put them down onto paper, when the cities went back to the railroad and said, okay, now is the time to actually take it to the, the next step, to go beyond 15% planning, the railroad had changed their minds on what they had previously agreed upon in the document. So that's kind of put us into an interesting pickle. So right now, that's where the community, uh, Chandler and Gilbert, are directly working with the railroad again to, um, to adhere to any of the concerns or changes that they have had since the original uh, report came out. So I hope that makes sense. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Pete Sutton, um, and I'm going to direct this at Kelly first, but anybody else who wants to jump in can. Um, he asks, what is your take on existing rails with trails that have no fencing? So I'll just kind of answer that from um, the information that we gathered from trail managers in our report, and, and what we found of those 88 that were interviewed, that. 70% of those of those projects have some type of barrier, and and the most common barrier is fencing. But other trails use um, vegetation barriers or grade separation, or you know there might be some type of grade separation or ditch that's naturally occurring, um, or another type of or another type of barrier. Um, some of them have no barriers at all. So I think that. It really depends on the operational characteristics of the railroads. Um, you know, whether how, how frequent service is, how fast trains go. The railroad is gonna is probably gonna definitely dictate whether or not you need to have any type of barrier there. And so as you saw in some of the images, I think um, from the beginning of the presentation, you know, there there are plenty of examples of rails with trails that um, have no barrier and where the separation is really minimal, um, you know, even as close as eight, eight feet um, or, or less. So I think it just really depends a lot on what the, the railroad is requiring, um, you know, and then kind of what there are uh, guidelines that you can look to in the um, FHWA report that we mentioned at the beginning that's on our website as well. Um, anybody else have comments on on fencing or other types of barriers? Yes, I. This is Jerry. May I go ahead, Jerry? Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, uh, especially in in Pennsylvania, railroads succeeded the canal owners by picking up ownership of those old canal corners. And in the case of the CETA Joint Rail Authority, we own the North Shore Railroad, which runs parallel to the North Branch Canal Trail, under canal. And we 
do not need, we are going to keep ownership of the canal because it helps to stabilize the roadbed of, of the railroad, but we had a land appraisal done on the towpath, which is on the other side of the canal from the railroad, and the adjacent land that goes over to the edge of the north uh, branch of the Susquehanna River. And we are donating that land so that the towpath can be used for the North Branch uh, Canal Trail. And we will allow the canal to be used as a, an, an interest feature, a, a historic feature, with some uh, restoration of, of a couple of old locks. And uh, the point I'm uh, trying to illustrate is if there are those kinds of constraints, look at them as an opportunity and talk to the railroad and to see if they would be willing to get rid of the towpath um, and the other lands like that. And then what we're doing is we got this land appraised and we are donating that. And so the trail sponsors will be able to use that as local match for a state DCNR grant for the trail. Thank you, Jerry. Um, this next question is for Matt. Um, Champ wants to know what carrier uh, underwrote your insurance policy. Mm, good question. Um, we we have an insurance um, kind of people with the city that that do that that work for me. So um, it, we've had different insurance carriers, but it's, it's with our the one that does all of our municipal um, you know vehicles, buildings, all of that. So we just added it on to that. That our overall insurance um, carrier, um, but I don't think it was a big issue for uh, for finding uh, someone to, to take that on. Um, I did work with them quite a bit on showing the areas and, and provided maps and exhibits that show exactly where the insurance um, coverage uh, is, is a, applies. Um, so, uh, but could I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Could I add? Um, Bob McCarthy at McRail is an insurance broker that I believe has a multi-state uh, territory beyond Pennsylvania. So those of you back here in the east, uh, you could contact Bob McCarthy at McRail Corp. Okay, thanks guys. I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to start with Kelly, but I'll open it up to the whole panel after. Um, Joe Sanders asked if we can show these rail with trail projects have economic benefit to the communities um, because that's usually the first question they're asked about for trails in general. Yeah, and I'm glad you asked this question. Um, rail to Trails Conservancy has done a lot of work in studying the economic impact of trails and we have um, dozens of individual uh, trails that are surveyed economic impact analyses on our website. So we, we do a lot of this work and, you know, we do see that um, trails of all different types um, certainly do help to impact and strengthen local economies. I'm going to just draw from a, a Rail with Trail example. Um, one of the economic impact studies that we did was on the DNL trail in Lehigh Gorge, uh, Pennsylvania area, scenic, beautiful scenic area in Pennsylvania. Um, the trail is 25 miles long, um, and it is one that um, has excursion rail that operates alongside it and actually offers users the option of loading their bicycles on the train. And so, you know, creating a loop experience um, and riding the train and the trail within the same within the same bit day, um, they get about sixty-five thousand users per year, um, and the total economic impact that's reported for that trail is six million dollars. So it's a twenty-five mile trail um, and rail with trail, six million dollar uh, annual economic impact. So we certainly um, understand that that is one of the first questions that you're asked as trail advocates and planners. And we do have a lot of resources um, to help equip you to, to better answer that question. Um, but I'll also open it up 
to the rest of the group too if you want to say anything about economic impact in trails. Yeah, here in Fayetteville, we've seen a real positive impact on the economic development. I don't know if you noticed in some of my pictures, there's a little coffee shop that actually their front door is the trail and then, then it's the tracks, um, so just north of our depot. Uh, we've seen apartment complexes uh, specifically locate right on the trail system. Um, so it's becoming a large economic engine. One resource that you might uh, contact is David Cayley. K-A-H-L-E-Y, uh, at the Progress Fund, and they have uh, invested with uh, low interest loans for small startup businesses along the Great Allegheny Passage Trail, and they've got lots of information about how the Great Allegheny Passage Trail system from Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland, uh, which then connects to the CNO Canal Trail on into Washington, D.C. But they've got lots of examples of how uh, bed and breakfast, um, sandwich shops, ice cream shops, brew pubs, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of small businesses have grown up as uh, in close proximity to the trail. Thanks, Jerry. Um, it looks like we've just about reached the end of our scheduled time together. Um, I really want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation, and especially our panelists for providing some great content. Um, I hope you found these presentations informative and useful for your work, as well as the Q&A session. Um, again, as I mentioned at the start of this, you'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after this webinar with a link to the recorded version, um, as well as a feedback survey, contact information, um, in case you want to uh, get any of your unanswered questions answered. We'll also try to, to cycle through um, the unanswered questions to try to provide a direct response to you guys via email. Um, thanks again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for, again for attending. Thank you. Thank you.